Hello and welcome to today's expert webinar presented by Accountants World. Our guest today, our presenter today, will be Tom Hood, CEO of the Maryland Association of CPAs, and he'll be speaking on the future of accounting, big waves of change, and oceans of opportunity. I want to thank you for joining us today. My name is Div Bansali. I'm a vice president here at Accountants World. I want to mention that uh, we're going to be live tweeting during today's webinar using the hashtag expert webinar. You'll see that on the bottom left of my opening slides here. So feel free to follow along and uh, and we'd love to get your feedback as well um, on what Tom is talking about and what's being covered in here. A couple of brief housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, in terms of the GoToWebinar control panel, if you don't see the control panel, you should see an orange arrow and you can use that to expand or hide the panel at any time. You can select your audio option uh, by clicking on the audio tab. You can select to listen in via computer speakers or via telephone. If you select phone call, it'll give you a dial-in number and an access code there. Tom has a PDF available under handouts, under the handouts tab. And so if you haven't downloaded that yet, it's called T Hood EWS presentation.pdf. You can download that at any time and follow along with Tom as he goes through his presentation. And if you have any questions for Tom, he'll be answering them throughout the presentation uh, when we have poll questions and if there are any at the end of the presentation as well. Uh, you can just type in your question under the questions tab. Make sure to click send or enter in order for your question to come through to us. We do offer one CP for today's webinar, and that's based on active participation during the live webinar. Active participation means three things. You attend the live webinar for no less than 50 minutes. You respond to all three polling questions that Tom has during the webinar. And then there's a post-webinar survey that opens up as soon as you close out of the GoToWebinar window at the end of the webinar. So when you see that survey, you go ahead and fill that out. If you don't see that survey come up, don't worry about it. We're going to email out a link uh, to that survey as well. So just fill it out as quickly as you can. Uh, you'll be notified by email within three business days about your CP eligibility. And uh, if you're not seeing any emails come through from us, just add webinar at accountantsworld.com to your trusted email list on your email provider. I wanted to briefly mention another event that Accountants World is going to start hosting very soon here that we're really excited about. Um, client accounting services is one of the uh, hottest topics in accounting at this point. And um, we have put together uh, both a PDF guide uh, to offering client accounting services, but the latest thing we're offering is a webinar dedicated to learning how to build a premier client accounting services practice. Um, and so in this webinar, we're going to show you how uh, our solution, Accounting Power, gives you stronger control over client accounting so that you can best serve the needs of all of your accounting clients, how client accounting services can allow your staff to do what your client staff currently does, except that you can do it faster, easier, and more accurately, all without leaving your office, and how you can turn bill payment into a highly profitable service. We'll be offering this webinar on a weekly basis starting on August 14th. And if you'd like to get automatically registered for the first webinar uh, without having to sign up anywhere else again, when you get to the post-webinar survey, you'll see a question about the upcoming CAS webinar. Simply indicate yes on that question and we'll get you automatically signed up and you'll receive a reminder email before that event on August 14th. So we look forward to seeing you at that event in just a couple of weeks here. Before I turn over the floor to Tom Hood, just a brief uh, bio on him. Uh, Tom has, and, and I find this absolutely astonishing, he has over 600,000 followers across his various social accountants, accounts. He is a top 100 influencer for all of LinkedIn. Uh, that's not just across accounting, but that's across every industry and vertical on LinkedIn. And he's been the CEO of MACPA for 20 years and one of the biggest influencers uh, that our industry has. So at this time, it's my pleasure to introduce Tom Hood and turn the floor over to him. All right. Well, thank you, Div, and uh, welcome everyone on this. I guess it could be could be morning or afternoon, depending on where you are. And it's uh, it's certainly an honor to be here. I think uh, Div, you probably just started with a uh, a good intro. Actually, you know what? I just lost my. 
And one piece of technical difficulty here. Let me get back to my uh, big screen. So Div and the crew, it looks like for some reason the screen left my monitor. Hang on one second. Yeah. All right, I think we're back now. Can you guys see the screen is up there? Uh, we are seeing uh, your screen. Uh, we're seeing, uh, yep, so now we see the PowerPoint up in front uh, of the screen. Okay. All right, so you should be seeing right now the opening title slide, right? So make sure yes. you're seeing what I'm seeing. Okay. So uh, Div started out by talking about accounts world and uh, client accounting services, and that is one of the big ways that you should be writing. And we're going to talk a lot more about that as we go forward. But I kind of start out with this idea that in this um, world of fast moving change, it feels like the waves are getting bigger and uh, coming faster. And are you there? Yeah, uh, Tom, would you mind just making your uh, uh, presentation full screen? I see two slides on my screen uh, right now. So I was. Okay. Whoop, hang on. I see it. Swap, please. Sorry about that. How's that work? Is that good? Did be there? I'm, I'm uh, okay. Yes. Now we see it. Here we now go. We see it. Yep. That's good. Perfect. Okay. All right. So I, I think back to this notion that we're uh, we're starting to feel the waves getting bigger and coming in faster, and the reason for that actually has to do with chess. So I don't know if you guys have uh, followed this uh, the story of how chess was invented, but uh, apparently it goes back to ancient India, and a uh, emperor was looking for a challenging game. And so he challenged the kingdom to, to come up with something cool, and uh, one, of his, one of his ministers came up with this game called chess. So he presented it to him, the emperor loved it, said, this is so great, I'll pay you whatever you want for it. And uh, the minister said, well, it's pretty simple. Uh, your Highness, I want one grain of rice on the first square, and I want you to double that every square after that. So two, four, eight, right? And how many rows are there in a game of chess? And I think, uh, or how many squares? I think you, uh, most of you guys would know it's, it's 64. So, you know, you think about that, well, how big can that get? And uh, usually when I ask that question, someone will give me a couple of guesses, usually up could be a million, uh, maybe as high as a billion, but actually 64 squared uh, or two to the 64th gets to be a pile of rice bigger than Mount Everest. And that, uh, when the emperor found, figured that out, probably about three rows in, he uh, had the guy's head cut off. So I don't know what the, that, that part of the story is about, but the fact is that this idea of exponential change is pretty big. Now, Albert Bartlett is a physicist, and he says the greatest shortcoming of the human race is our inability to understand the exponential function. Now, think about that, right? The greatest shortcoming. That's a pretty big statement. And I think he's true, because in fact, 
that's what's causing a lot of these big waves of change, right? It is the exponential pace of what? I'm sure you guys know it's technology. And so technology has been driving change in our profession since um, I know since I've been around, certainly in the 90s when the uh, AIC paid the division project, it was identified then. But I would say what's different about it, technology's always been here, we've always had change, all that's the same. But think about what's different, right? It's the accelerating speed of change that I think is putting us off guard. And that's where we get to this idea of being future ready. And I'm gonna share with you some, some thoughts about that. We've been studying this for a while. We've been polling uh, CPAs all over the, actually quite frankly, the world. And, uh, and so we have some ideas that might help you guys be a little bit better, a little bit more future ready as we look at the future. So let's start with this notion that um, a great book, by the way, I'm gonna give you a good uh, rest of the summer reading list while we go. And this would be one of them. It's, it's uh, thank you for being late, Thomas Friedman, New York Times columnist. He's famous for, um, for writing the world is flat. So he kind of been following this revolution. And uh, in, in his book, he talks about uh, this graph by Astro Teller, who's the CEO of the Google uh, X projects. And I think they put it well, if you look at the exponential curve of technology, and you think about that humans pretty much adapt at a linear pace. And the point he makes, and I think he's right, I think he's onto something, it says that we're actually at a point now where the technology has exceeded our capabilities of adapting well. And I think that explains like a lot of things, it explains why we often feel overwhelmed, why all these technologies keep moving at us, information overload, you know, you name it. Those are all commonplace things. And I think even this whole polarization of our uh, society is probably related to the ability for us to not quite be able to understand everything anymore. And uh, there's some other pieces of evidence around that. So this is Klaus Schwab World Economic Forum in Davos, uh, actually a couple years ago, and he said this, he said, we stand on the brink of a technological revolution that will fundamentally alter the way we live, work, and relate to one another. In its scale, scope, and complexity, the transformation will be unlike anything humankind has ever experienced before. Um, and I think that it's, it's in those key words, right? Scale, scope, and complexity, because I think that's what's going on. This, Exponential pace of change is like combining and recombining and creating even more um, turbulence, if you will. And by the way, where that turbulence is, is also opportunity. So my hope is to help you see through this fog of uncertainty a bit and begin to think about some of these waves you could ride. Now, here's another one. This is a friend of ours, Daniel Burris, a global futurist. But he says in the next five years, game-changing technologies will transform every business process including how we sell, market, communicate, collaborate, educate, and train. Now, what's the common word that you saw in both of those slides? Anybody remember? Hopefully you thought about transformation. Now, what's different between transformation and change? So change is when you do things differently. Transformation is actually when you're doing different things. Another way I've heard it that I kind of like is change is changing what is. Transformation is transforming what isn't, like something new, creating something brand new. And, and I think this is important because there's a tendency on all of us that when we get a new technology or we think about new ways of doing things, we begin to go back and do things the way we did and just make them go faster using the technology. And I would suggest as you start thinking about the potential here that you don't get stuck in that trap. Actually, we call that paving cow paths. And that's from the old uh, lean days where they used to talk about, you know, the straightest distance two points is a straight line. We look at, at where most roads aren't straight lines. That's because in the old days that what they would do is they paved cow paths because that was the easiest place. It was already cleared and, and roughly flat. And so that's the part you can't do, right? That would be like change. It's just incrementally paved these things. 
transforming and saying, no, what's the best distance, the best way to get there? Let's clear that path. So I want you to keep that in your mind as we go. So I think this idea is the opportunity is what can you do to transform your accounting practice, uh, transform what you do as a, a CPA or accountant? Um, here's another guru that kind of puts it this way. He says, if the, this is Jack Welch. If the rate of change on the outside exceeds the rate of change on the inside, the end is near. Another way to think about that, right, is if you're letting the outside world get ahead of you, your chances are you're going to be disrupted by that, meaning you're going to be forced to change on the world's terms. Whereas if you start to think about it ahead of time and begin to say, what should I be doing to take advantage of this? You can disrupt yourself and become a disruptor as opposed to being the one that is disrupted. And that brings us to what I would call one of our big challenges. And, and Div, that's when we're going to hit our first poll, if you would, um, just to see what, what you guys are thinking about. What's your biggest challenge? So Div's uh, role in that, please click on your answer, and then we'll talk about it. These have been things that we've seen now consistently across our entire profession. And uh, it'll be interesting to see what the group thinks. All right, sounds great. So I've gone ahead and launched the first poll question. So please select one of the following. Uh, what is your biggest challenge? A reminder, this is the first of the three poll questions we'll have today, which are required in order to earn CP credit. So we'll take another 20 seconds or so to allow you to select one of the options. Don't forget to click the submit button to make sure that it is um, captured. By the way, uh, while we have a break here, Tom, there was a question that came in from Gary who asked, the graph that you had before with the exponential growth, uh, does that graph mean that technology has reached a point where we are no longer able to adapt? Well, I think it, I think the answer is we've always adapted to technology. I think what they're saying is that the speed of it has gotten a bit ahead of us, as you saw in that graph. So I think that the opportunity, and quite frankly, the challenge is that there will be some people that might be left behind on this technology thing. And uh, the opportunity is for us to learn more about what we can do to adapt and get ahead of it. In fact, that's what my my goal here will be to give you some techniques to be thinking about that. All right, so we'll take about 10 final seconds here for people to vote in the poll if you haven't done so already. We should have the Jeopardy music. <laughs> <laughs> All right, going once, going twice. Okay, so Tom, we see 39% said being reactive versus proactive followed closely by automation of accounting services and talent recruitment and retention. Okay, so interesting enough, the, um, this has been consistent with what we found. Basically, that number one challenge that's on that slide right there is exactly that, right? It is being reactive versus proactive, which, which is making the point that that other slide had, that we're feeling that all we can do is keep up, we can't get ahead. Uh, and then if you look at the next two, you know, automation of accounting, again, that's an opportunity, but often we're so busy we might miss it or it isn't quite there yet. And then obviously talent recruitment retention, the skills of our team, uh, and in, in fact, our skills are often now lagging. And that's another big one. I just read a study today from uh, one of the CFO publications that, that CFOs are, um, their teams are lacking behind in talent which is impacting those other two, right? That's why you can't automate and you can't be proactive. So um, thank you guys for participating in that. Let's keep moving. So th where this came from, uh, it was 2015, and Dr. James Canton, a another global futurist, did a study for the AICPA or CPA.com and found that 92% of CPAs admitted that they weren't future ready. Now, what does that mean? Well, he said it's the capacity to be anticipatory, to be aware, predictive, and adaptive of emerging technology and trends in business, demographics, and the social environment that impact your organization uh, and, and industry, and I would say also your clients. And so that's really what got us thinking. I mean, literally, we've been working on this for the last three or four years um, to say, what can we be doing to help CPAs and accountants get ahead? Uh, right? And this gets to this um, old Chinese proverb from Lao Tzu. It says, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day. Teach a man how to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. So my hope today is that we 
teach you a bit about fishing and maybe surfing so that you can ride these big waves of change. So that's what we're going to get ready to do. And it, it starts with those three words. I would hope you actually write them down because I think they're really, really important, right? It is about being aware, predictive, and adaptive. So the first one we talk about is aware. Like, do you see the trends happening around you? And can you think about how they might impact you, your clients, uh, your firm or organization? So it's about getting your antennas up. And that's my hope in the next couple of slides here. So it starts with this idea of the fourth industrial revolution. I'd love to know how many of you guys have heard this term. Um, Quite often, many people have not heard it yet. I always thought there was only one industrial revolution, and uh, I was wrong. So apparently, the first industrial revolution was the automation of agriculture back in the 18th century, steam-powered stuff. Not until they got electric uh, and a grid did they connect lots and lots of, of people and organizations and then machines, and you got what we now know as the second industrial revolution, which is really where the accounting profession got started. It was in when people moved to cities, they suddenly had major big pieces of production, you know, steel and manufacturing and trade, and that required new skills. And by the way, those accountants actually came from the farms because there wasn't any other way to learn how to account for manufacturing. Um, third Industrial Revolution, most of us have lived through that. That's kind of the whole computer trend in the 20th century. But now we're at this, what they're calling the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, Dan Burris, our futurist, he calls it like the big deal phase. And that's why we're feeling a little bit crazy. We're hearing artificial intelligence, um, robots, um, internet of things, big data, cloud, all those things are kind of converging and accelerating. And we're gonna talk a little bit how to get a handle on those. But let's first kind of keep your antennas up and listen, we'll look at some of these trends. So one of the trends, I don't know if you guys have been paying attention, but you're uh, your local Toys R Us store, where I spent a ton of time with my um, family, has now been vaporized. Uh, another good book, if you want to look at this, uh, Bob Tarek talks about whatever can be vaporized will be vaporized. And you think about it, right? They uh, got killed in the e-commerce business, and they actually outsourced their e-commerce to Amazon about seven years ago. Now, you would think uh, a company that sophisticated, publicly traded, would have an idea about what was going on there, and somehow they just couldn't react fast enough uh, or couldn't change fast enough. And, um, and it's sad to see that kind of thing. Obviously, you go back to Blackbuster, Kodak, there's all kinds of disruption stories. But this trend of this technology thing is actually vaporizing a whole lot of businesses, right? How many of you guys still own a Garmin? Um, or one of those big video cameras we used to lug around when we were uh, filming our uh, kids' soccer games or football games, right? All that stuff has been shrunken, dematerialized, turned into bits, and they're all now in your camera. Actually, they say the camera's got about a million dollars worth of technology in it. Uh, so all these things are happening, and I would in encourage us to be looking around and paying attention to what's going on there because it could impact us, right? Our business, what we do as a profession. Uh, this is what I call the shot heard around the world. This was in March of uh, 2016. And this is when IBM Watson and KPMG announced the deal to start doing audits using artificial intelligence. And uh, the significance of this is, imagine how many auditors are in, in let's say if, if AT&T is being audited by KPMG, they're all over the world, right? Sampling those long slips that you get when you buy a phone in an AT&T store. And they're checking that, right, for revenue recognition, fraud, uh, validating the revenue in the stores, et cetera. And they're only doing a little fraction of that, right? Maybe 2%. And now Watson can do 100%. They're gonna plug the entire ERP database, General Ledger, into Watson, and Watson is going to be able to read that at a superhuman pace. Literally, it could take maybe an hour for it to check all those transactions, come up with a list of exceptions for people to really check. So that brings to mind, right, what, what does that mean? Well, some of the analysts are saying roughly, this is Deloitte and Accenture, saying that 40% of our basic accounting work will be automated by 2020. 
Now, what year is it? I think it's 2018. So uh, you might you might have uh, an issue with that percentage, and maybe it's not going to be that high. But let me give you some real world stories here. This was at our business and industry conference uh, a few months back, and in the middle there is. Mike Smith, the CFO of McCormick Spice. To the left is a chairman of MACPA, Ken Kelly, who is a global controller at McCormick. And he was telling the story about how they're using bots to automate big accounting functions at McCormick. And they affectionately are calling the bots after some of their spices, Old Bay and Pepper uh, in particular. Now those bots might have cute names, but they're doing serious work. One of them looks at their entire supply chain and checks all the invoice flow you know how many like how many supply chain transactions are going through McCormick Spice as a global spice manufacturer? And think about that, right? And accountants used to do all that by themselves, right? Looking at all the stuff. Now the bots basically go in and try to reconcile everything it possibly can with this um, one purpose program. That's what bots typically are. And then it only gives a small percentage of the exceptions to the accounting group to ultimately reconcile. So literally. Um, they probably have automated somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 jobs by deploying those bots effectively. That's significant stuff, and that's happening today. It's not Star Wars. Now, let's look at where this is going. So here's a small firm in Southern Maryland, who I know really well, Samantha Bowling, now the new chair of Maryland Association CPAs, and she's using MindBrid, which is a, a software, a artificial intelligence out of uh, Toronto, to do small audits of public company, I mean, excuse me, small audits of private companies in Southern Maryland and, and some of her uh, nonprofit clients. It's that cheap. So in, in a span of two years, you went from what could have been a nine-figure buy at KPMG for IBM Watson to a local firm being able to use this technology profitably in their own practice. And I would say, she, luckily, she's not paving cow paths. She's not just doing the efficiency of the audit. She's saying, I'm going to increase the risk risk profile, being able to look at transactions and identify risk. So she's really using the technology for value added, not just efficiency automation. And take, take that in point as we talk about how to ride these waves of change. So I think that's pretty cool. And uh, it just shows you that in this, how fast the technology is. Now, here's the good news for all of you out there. Of course, you've got, you know, Accountants world working on all kinds of these client accounting services, automating stuff in a really, really cool way. That's what we mean. That stuff that you might have looked at even two years ago that could have been out of reach or completely not working really well could be completely transformed right now. So I would say the old days where you said, yeah, I looked at that two years ago and it wasn't anything. You might have to change that now and start to say, let's look at some other stuff. All right, I'm going to go through a couple more quick just um, – Again, aware slides, but I really want to spend most of our time in the predict and adapt phase. This is just another example of how much the world's changing, right? 15 years and all of the major publicly top publicly traded companies are asset light. They're all technology companies. And um, it only took 15 years for that to happen, right? To be all technology companies. Now, this worries me a bit because our profession, the one thing we don't know how to do is we don't know how to account for intangible assets and that happens to be the primary driver of, uh, of all those valuations so um, that's just another point in this whole notion of pay attention to what's going on blockchain you guys are probably hearing tons about blockchain uh, my point is I think it's it's still a little early but if you want a really good book another book for your reading list the truth machine uh, Michael Casey and Paul Vigna um, I think Casey was a former Deloitte auditor but the point here is if blockchain gets to the point where it actually can do all these transactions the way these guys imagine, uh, it will be disruptive to our profession. Again, I think it's a, a few years out, so I don't know that you need to go take blockchain courses, but you need to be familiar with it. So uh, that's the point here. Uh, we're seeing, uh, this is a white paper, AICPA, CPA Canada. Every one of these papers about the future of audit, the future of accounting, talk about the need for us to be anticipatory, to actually be looking ahead and not just spending time on today or the past. So I think that's a major point here. Here's one more. This is actually in the Forbes article, the uh, Audit of the Future. 
And uh, this idea that we have to be looking forward through the windshield, not just rear view mirror, I think is the major point that we should be thinking about. And so as you start thinking about how you can reposition yourself, what can you be doing to guiding clients about the future and not just telling them what happened? And we have to be, get better at offering insight. Our knowledge of accounting in the language of business needs to be interpreted for the folks that don't understand it. That's what they rely on us for. And so whether it's tax or accounting or auditing, you guys have to be the folks that can help add those insights for your clients. Okay. Uh, last one on blockchain, and this one I just want to make this point because everyone says, well, why would we ever have to know about this? So this is McCormick again, uh, McCormick Spice. They're working with a consortium, IBM, I think um, Walmart, Nestle, a couple other players are actually looking at the food supply chain to say, what can we do to make that better? Now, if you're in accounting and you happen to have someone in agriculture or food supply and they're selling to one of these big manufacturers, there's a high likelihood that in the next year or so, you might be having to be familiar with blockchain from a supply chain perspective. So you might have to be thinking about how do I understand transactions that are going into blockchain or coming out, because it might impact how your client's getting paid or billing people. So pay attention to it, especially in that area. I think we're also seeing it in health, medical records, um, the financial services industries are spending tons and tons of money in this area. So if you're into, if you've got banking uh, clients, you should watch it as well. All right, so I hope your antennas are up. Obviously, most of those examples were around technology. That's the fastest moving one. But now I'm gonna teach you a little bit how to predict and maybe get ahead as you think about some of these things that are going on. So this gets to, can you predict the future? What do you guys think? Uh, we would say, actually, uh, our work with uh, Dan Burris would say, yeah, we can predict some things. And his point is, in his 30 years of work, he says, I like to focus on the, what he calls certainty, those things driven by hard trends, comfortable hanging his hat on future facts. And then he doesn't have to pay attention to all the other clutter, the things that might happen or could happen, which have to be soft trends. And we're going to give you a little primer on that that you can actually play with a bit. So th this idea about what can we actually predict, and it turns out there's three things, most of which would be pretty familiar to us as accountants and CPAs. So here are the three categories of hard trends, government regulations and standards, demographics, and technology. And I'm going to show you a bit about how these things. So trends are all things that are moving. They have direction and they have speed. And so I want to talk a little about these. You know, government regulation standards pretty much will continue to increase year after year after year. We've got plenty of examples of that. Technology is the one that's actually accelerating exponentially, which makes that one particularly tricky. And that's the one we have to really kind of keep our eyes on. Demographics, by the way, is what we would call a cyclical trend. It's, it's a wave, right? There's so many people born and then there's, you know, dips and then there's more. But you can predict, right? We know how many people are on the planet or in a city or in a state at any given time. And we could theoretically look at that and say, well, how many people are going to be retiring and what are they going to need when they uh, become grade school, et cetera. So demographics are, again, one of those um, very predictable trends that you can actually understand. So here's some of the stuff going on, the regs and standards, right? RevRec, lease accounting, Tax Cut and Jobs Act, GDPR coming over from the EU, uh, and most recently the Wayfair uh, SALT decision, right? State and local tax. All of these are things that we have to keep up with, right? And if you're in accounting, you're probably doing everything you can to keep up with the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, et cetera. But let me just give you a point about what it means to be anticipatory. When the Tax Cut and Jobs Act now, right? Then, the really smart CPA said, I've got to know about that because when my clients come in to do their taxes, the first thing they're going to do is ask me about that. And so the, the smart CPAs and accounts were going, I understand how long I'm going to help talk to my client about as much as I know. I can also tell them the parts I don't know yet, but I could say I'm going to schedule a meeting with you this summer to really review what it means and what it's going to be for you as you get into next year end. Be proactive from that standpoint. 
Same with this Wayfair Salt decision. If you have clients that are doing lots of e-commerce, chances are this decision is going to impact you in terms of what you have to do from the uh, sales tax on uh, e-commerce. So those are just some examples to say, how does that work? And what can I be doing proactively when I see these things coming? Because we know we're going to get the TCJA version two. Um, I think we're now at a point where every other administration will probably be passing and deleting laws every four or eight years, depending on how these politics work. So uh, that's a huge opportunity for us in, in our profession. Might not be fun living through it, but uh, certainly a good opportunity. Now, this is the whole um, regulation piece, and it gets to this notion of shortage. Everything we read is about accounting shortage. It's based on physical demographics. There's only about two thirds of Gen X, which would be the manager level people, like from 30 to 45 or 50 years old, that would be the next level of, of management and leadership. And so the shortage at the manager level is driven by the hard trends of demographics. Millennials now are the largest generation of the workforce. The biggest demographic age is 26 years old. There's 10,000 baby boomers a day retiring. So just imagine a little small curve and on one end is baby boomers, which will be shrinking. At the bottom of the smile is Gen X, two thirds of those uh, of the boomers. And the millennials are like slightly bigger than the boomers right now and will only get bigger as the boomers decline. So uh, as they go to retirement, although counter trend, they're living longer and many of them are working longer, which means you have an opportunity to extend the employment of some of those really talented boomers and, and high move your high potential millennials up faster to make up for the gap in Gen X, right? That's how you deal with a hard trend. Or you can just keep advertising for that manager position and you're going to find it's going to take months and months and months to get a nibble. So I think there's another, another one of those examples of how you use these trends to your benefit. Like hard trend, talent shortage, demographics. What do we need to do? Let's be creative. Well, let's automate more things, be less reliant on talent, fast track our young people, so we can skip that uh, management layer that we might need and play around with it from that standpoint. So kind of get the feel for how that might work. Now, what are the top 10 technology trends? We've surveyed about uh, 2,000 CPAs in the past year all over the place. And this is what we get, right? Top 10 ranked in that order. And uh, this was starting out with Dan Burris's top 20 uh, business trends. So the first question for you guys, First question is, do you understand those trends, right? Do you actually understand what they are? And the second one is, what are those trends going to mean? So let's predict, right? If AI, machine learning, and cognitive computing move forward in audit and tax, what's an opportunity in that for me? Well, if I find like Samantha did, MindBridge, I could apply that to audit and, and begin to offer new services. Notice I didn't say just automate stuff efficient automate new ways of risk analysis and management to help clients find uh, potential fraud or potential areas of, of concern by doing 100 percent test big data and high-speed data analytics you know are you doing big data are you using tableau or any of these things or are you doing dashboards right i mean looking at all your clients data on a monthly basis and finding the patterns and the trends and talking to them and saying hey the receivables just spiked up you know, what's happening there? Or it looks like your margins are going down. Can I help you look at some stuff there? That would be an example of taking that hard trend and saying, what's the opportunity? Now, the other part of a hard trend is what we call a predictable problem. Meaning, what's the predictable problem you're going to face if you ignore the hard trend? So this is where you have to worry about, like, what could happen? So if I ignore... Uh, virtualization automation of processes and services in my firm or for my clients, then there's a chance that someone else is going to come along and show the client something a lot cooler that might save them a lot of money or, or help them with their talent situation. And suddenly I will be less relevant, could be potentially losing some business. That's how we have to think about these hard trends because the, the thing that Burris has found in 30 years of research is they're going to happen whether we like them or not. So one of my favorite sayings that he uses is, it can be done, it will be done. If you don't do it, someone else will. 
So I think that's how we have to think about that. Now, uh, I'm going to skip through this one uh, through the time, but but we actually, you can write that URL down. It's in the handout. If you're so inclined, you could log on and throw some um, some stuff in there, and uh, we'd be more than happy to distribute this back to the accountants world folks to send uh, send out to you guys if you want. These are examples of how we use these trends to predict ultimately what we could be looking at from an opportunity standpoint. So we, we already covered increase you increase in baby boomers retiring. Well, I mean, increased need for retirement, wealth, and succession plans. Wow, big opportunity. Uh, what happens if you don't do anything about this with your clients? You could lose your clients if other firms do it and you don't. Increase in the tax implication of PCGA and Supreme Court sales, salt services for clients and planning opportunities with insights, predictable problem, clients might seek others if we don't do this. Increase in cloud accounting systems and apps. Accountants world. Significant efficiency from automating accounting apps, data analytics for clients, CAS and outsource CFO, fastest growing firm services, and our competition could get ahead of us if we don't offer it. By the way, there's one thing I love. There's a great story that I remember did, um, working with you guys on, which actually is, a, I think it's a, a accounting, might be a CPA in New Jersey, who deployed his client accounting service through Accountants World and uses it to get ahead of the taxes. So this whole tax crunch that we go through and, and no one's ready with their data, et cetera, he's actually strategically using his client accounting services, getting all his client's books cleaned up by year end, and then he's got the data correctly to do flow into the tax returns, which, which I love. I mean, that's, a, that's what we should be doing with this client accounting service. That's what we mean by being proactive. Um, and you can see cloud practice management systems and apps and CPA firms. Cloud allows efficiencies. Remember, transforming our business processes. Uh, remote access by teams. Big, big, highly valued thing in the profession. Uh, and then the firm team members view the firm as using obsolete technology. You may look at other firms if you don't do this kind of stuff. So a couple of uh, big ideas there. And again, use those three buckets of hard trends. Think about where opportunities are. Just sit down and write your brainstorm down. And then write about the predictable problems that would say, if these trends continue, what could happen to my client or to me? We also see lots of firms adding these insights for, from a client perspective. So some cool stuff there. Uh, I want to wrap up with, uh, with one of Dan Burris's pieces of advice, which I think is, is awesome. Um, he would say, tomorrow there will be even more fires to put out. If you don't keep them from starting in the first place, put the opportunity hour in your calendar now if you don't, the future you end up with might not be the one you would have wanted. So the point of all this is you're going to always have fires. You're going to always be reacting to stuff. But if you just spent one hour and said, I'm not going to catch up on email, I'm not going to you know, do all this kind of catch up stuff in the past, I'm going to spend one hour thinking about the future, doing some hard trend work, getting yourself focused on what you could do. That could make a huge difference. One hour a week, like put it on your calendar, like you would a workout or whatever, and then do it, right? Do it. Uh, I do mine on, a, on Saturday morning real early. Usually I'll get up and, and do that kind of scanning and future-oriented work. So last point about this is I call it the R-O-N-I. All the things we talk about, let's say, should we invest in that new technology? Should we do this? Do we have the time to do that? We always think about like, what's the ROI, return on investment. I think the other point here, this comes from, from uh, Clayton Christensen, uh, who wrote The Innovator's Dilemma. He would say this idea of what's the risk of not investing, right? Instead of return on investment, what's the risk of not investing? In other words, in a time of really fast change, a no actually creates a straight line, right? We're not doing it, we're not spending money, but we're not doing anything. And as things are moving faster, right, all of a sudden you could see a downward trend in terms of your profitability or your ability to catch up. And that's the risk of not investing. So I would encourage you to ask both questions. What's the return on investment? And what's the risk if we don't do this? It's the cost of a no. All right, we're gonna finish up here. Hey, uh Tom, should I uh, should I go ahead and launch the uh, second poll question before we go? Oh, to the you know what? I forgot. I suppose you right before that one. Let's launch that one. 
All right. So yeah, so, let's get to this point of how fast. Thank you, Jim. Are sure. you guys moving fast enough? Would be the question. Is your organization now that you know about these trends, are you moving fast enough? So one is not at all. Five is really, really rocking it. All right, sounds great. So the poll is open now. Go ahead and select one of those options from one through five. Make sure to click the submit button as well to make sure that your vote is counted here. Um, by the way, uh, Tom, one question that had come in earlier, uh, Rick and someone else both had a similar question, which was, what if my biggest challenge is not my firm embracing technology, but my clients and prospects embracing technology? All right, so there's two options there, right? One is, you know, this idea, can you walk them into the future? So basically, is there a way you can start to talk about, and this is where I would use these hard trends, right? Say, you do know that there's a shortage in accounting talent. So if you can't automate things and your 65-year-old bookkeeper or controller leaves, you're going to be stuck in, in old antiquated systems that are, are going to be really tough. If you could outsource it to me, you could move to the cloud faster, get more efficient, and get much better data. Uh, that's one way. I think the, uh, the other one is also we're starting to see firms firing clients. So, I mean, if, if all your clients are in the past, that's a big challenge. If, if a few of them, I would go with the ones who are most progressive that are willing to move, and move with them because the way this stuff is moving, you don't want to have a base of clients that's um, in too much in that old school. So I would yeah. say you want to really look hard at that. Uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to add just one quick thought to that, just on what you just said. We spoke to one of our customers recently who's been using Accountants World's uh, accounting solution for a while to introduce uh, CAS to their practice. And uh, they said one of the side benefits of introducing CAS and, and providing more strategic services has been he's identified which clients are ideal moving into the future, who are ready to move with them both in terms of technology and processes, as well as the bottom 10% who simply are not going to do that. And those are the first candidates to get fired. Exactly. That's brilliant advice. I think, I think we have to, I know it's really hard for us, but the other thing is you don't really have to fire the client. What you have to do is raise the fee. And say, you know, in order to serve you, because you're not automated, I've got to do a lot of extra work. And so that I'm going to have to charge you more for. And, you know, you raise that fee. And, and uh, if they stay, great, you're going to make more money and they'll be more valuable. And if they leave, they're going to leave because, you know, they couldn't afford you. And then they should go find a really low cost, uh, low service provider from that standpoint. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close out the poll question here in just about five seconds. I think almost everyone has voted, but please get your vote in if you haven't. All right, going once, going twice. Okay, so Tom, we've got 39% who said they are at a three right now, 29% at a two, and 17% at a four. I'm going to non-scientifically do this. I bet you're probably about 2.7 which tends to be the industry standard. So think about it, three is about, you know, middle of the point. Uh, if the world's accelerating, you probably want to be pushing three to four, maybe four and above. I know there's a couple of you are even at the five level, congrats. So I think let's do the next poll, Div, that says, basically says, so what, what does moving fast look like? And again, we've surveyed a whole bunch of accounts and CPAs and, uh, and we've gotten some of these things where they say, this is what we mean by moving fast. And I want to know what you guys think um, relative to this. Sounds great. So I've just gone ahead and opened up poll question number three. So please go ahead and uh, vote on that. Tom, one other question that uh, came in from Michael was, um, what are your thoughts on dealing or discussing these trends with senior partners who may not have embraced technology yet? Oh, that's the best thing we find, right? We We've uh, actually worked with a bunch of firms where we use the hard trends really as a wake-up call because the fact that, that they are facts, they're not like debatable, means, okay, there's a consequence if we don't look at these. So I think it's a great conversation to take this PowerPoint deck and sit down with them and say, look, I just attended this webinar and there's a lot of stuff going on. I just want you to, I want to know what you think. Here's the point. You don't go tell them that you're not moving fast enough or all. They're going to say, well, we've been successful, blah, blah, blah. What you do want to do, though, is say, I got my eyes open to some of this stuff today, and I really want to know what you think about this, right? Keywords. What do you think? 
So don't tell, show them, say, here's what I heard on this thing, here's some of the things that came out. And I just want to know, what do you think about this? What should we be moving faster? And what should we be thinking about? Okay, sounds great. We're going to leave about 10 more seconds here for people to vote in number three before we go ahead and close that out. So it looks like uh, the winner right now, uh, I'll call the race, is uh, moving to the cloud uh, and using technology. That's always one of the top ones. But I will warn you that just going in and doing the technology without the right mindset and culture is a bit dangerous. So you want to make sure that your firm is ready or your, or your company, and you want to be able to do that in a what I call proactive way with everyone buying in. I think your point about getting your other partners connected is a big one. Um, and then it looks like tied for second and third is organizational transformation and then training on new skills, which interesting enough is about Oh, you got changing business models in there right behind it. So and the fact is almost all those are elements that you have to think about. But clearly, um, technology and training are the two biggest reasons organizations are falling behind. The third one, the organizational transformation, is the culture mindset piece. And I would argue that that's uh, almost foundational. But I think that's what you want to be thinking about as you look at how do I get my organization to move fast? You got the wisdom of the crowd right there in that poll, so I think that's kind of neat. All right, let's talk about how do we adapt. We, we're now aware, antenna's up. We're predicting. We can use the three hard trends to think about what we know is coming. And now it's about how do we ride these big waves of change, right? We're not going to stop them, but we can ride them. All right, uh, one more aware point. This one I love. Tom Peters, I'm a fan of him. He's big on Twitter. He's been a guru forever, but look at this exchange with a, a normal person asking him a question and, and his response. This guy says, my 17-year-old torn between nursing and accounting. I have no problem with accounting, but nursing seems future-proof. Now, what does that say? <laughs> He's saying that accountants aren't future-proof, right? <laughs> I'm giving up on them. Uh, Peter's quips back, both professions will undergo radical change to the point of unrecognizability. Learning the tap dance, commitment to continuous ed is the key. Back to the training point that you guys just talked about, right? Technology is one part of it, but without the training and people with new skill sets, you're gonna find it's hard to do. Um, which brings me to kind of my, my favorite quote, that's only because I said it, uh, but it says, in a period of rapid change and increasing complexity, the winners will be those uh, people who learn faster than the rate of change and faster than their competition, otherwise called L greater than C squared. Kind of write that down. And at least what, what they're actually saying is we should be reading about five hours a week. You got your book list from me. Um, start reading, right? Get on Amazon tonight, read, put them on audio books, listen to lots of different ways of, of getting smart about this stuff. And uh, up your learning game. Uh, I think we're going to have to keep that learning game up. Back to future ready. And this is why I feel strongly about this. The bottom line is we've got to increase our future readiness in order to navigate this fast future. In fact, every enterprise and every industry has got to get better at predicting what's coming. So by understanding the metrics, hard trends that influence our future, we can design with purpose a better preferred future. Isn't that what we all want to do? That's the big idea behind future readiness, to have the capacity to take action with intent, proactive intent, and design in order to change so in order to adapt quickly and thrive. That's why I feel passionate about this. I think that's what we're saying. Here's what we need to do. So when we started looking at what are the skills we're going to need in the future, we found like the top publications that were saying, here's what you need. And we mapped them. We created a big map that you can see here. And then we mapped training and content to those skills. So we've got what we call a future ready curriculum. But I want to um, kind of sum it up just so you can see it graphically. These are all the skills that we mapped. But here's the um, six publications that we use to actually create this. And these are the, we call the top eight skills you're gonna need. Now, the quick story here is the last one, functional and domain expertise, that's like, I call it a T-shaped professional. The vertical bar of the T is your accounting, auditing, tax, and the industries and clients that you have experience with. That's your functional, that's what you've acquired from college to now. The other competencies, the other seven, cross, create the crossbar. 
And we actually call those boundary crossing competencies because those competencies allow you to apply expertise across different domains and expertise. You could work with you know, a management consultant or you could work with an IT person or the insurance people because you have those skills that actually cross the boundaries, right? And so those boundary crossing skills are the ones hardest to automate by machine. That's why we kind of like that idea. And um, anyhow, those are the buckets. There's a lot of detail under that, but those are the types of skills you should be doing. So the first question I always ask is, if these are the top eight skills, cross off the bottom one, because that's table stakes, how much time and money are you investing in those other seven? If the answer is zero, your first question is, what can I do to make that 10% next year or 15%? And then it's like, pick the one that you think would make the biggest difference and get moving on that. That's how we build curriculums for some of the largest firms in the world and, and some of the largest corporate finance teams. So uh, get yourself thinking about future ready companies because the machines are coming um, rather fast. All right, last one about culture. This idea of culture is like culture's mindset, skill set, and tool set. This is Chris Allegretti, managing partner, of one of the top 50 firms in the United States. And his point is we've got to adopt this man anticipatory mindset, a future view based on hard trends that we see shaping our future, and then use those insights to help our clients capitalize on the opportunities of the company digital disruption. Um, Great book by our friend Dan Burris. I would encourage you to do it. Uh, if you go to our website, we actually do a learning system that's kind of based on that uh, format to give you a uh, experience over a few months to actually learn how to do that on a bigger, bigger basis. So I want to wrap this up with, remember we talked about aware, antenna up, predict, predict the things you can, let the other stuff fall away, right? You're, chance of success goes up and your risk goes down. And then adapt is to move forward in this fast paced world, you're gonna have to acquire new skills that are gonna put you in touch with the new technologies that are gonna keep you ahead, if you will, right? And use those to your advantage from that standpoint. And that's what we mean by being future ready. Uh, I wanna close with a guy that got beat by um, the predecessor of IBM Watson, Deep Blue, Gary Kasparov in chess, 1997. And he said, if we fail, it's not because our machines are too intelligent or not intelligent enough. If we fail, it's because we grew complacent and limited our ambitions. Our humanity is not defined by any skill like swinging a hammer or even playing chess. There's only one thing a human can do that a machine can't do, and that's dream. So I want to close this with saying I want you all to, to whatever you do, dream big and get out there and create that future that you all want and can imagine. There's my reading list, and uh, we got a couple of minutes, I guess, for some final questions. If there's any out there, Div. All right, thank you, Tom. Um, so if anybody else has any questions that they'd like to ask for Tom here, we've uh, got a couple minutes left, as he mentioned. Um, and uh, that several people here are saying thank you for your presentation. And obviously, I echo that as well. I think that was a really interesting presentation. If you haven't downloaded the PDF yet, um, I, I think there's a lot of material in there and obviously this reading list at the end as well. Um, so please go ahead and download that so that you can uh, reference that later and share it with other people in your firm as well. Um, I also want to uh, just go ahead and uh, mention here, and I'll, I'll wait a minute uh, before I close this to make sure there's any other questions, but uh, in the meantime, I did want to let people know the uh, next expert webinar in our series is going to be on August 22nd, and that's going to be Chester Elton. He's one of the leading experts on culture and leadership, uh, particularly as it relates to accounting firms, uh, and he'll be talking about how the best managers create a culture of belief. Tom just talked about culture a few minutes ago in his presentation as well, so Chester will be covering that in a lot greater detail there. That's on August 22nd. If you haven't already signed up for all of the expert webinars, you can go to 2018webinars.com and uh, you can go ahead and uh, sign up for all of the remaining expert webinars. We've got a bunch of really, really interesting speakers for the rest of the year as we've had today and, and earlier in the year as well. 
two final things. If you'd like a live personalized demonstration of Accountants World Solutions, including our solutions for client accounting services and strategic advisory services, um, please visit accountantsworld.com or you can call that 888-999-1366 number. Um, and a final reminder, if you're interested in learning more about CAS and how to deliver a premium CAS service to your clients and what that can do to help your firm as well, um, make sure to attend our August 14th webinar. You can register for that just by indicating yes on our post webinar survey, which will pop up in just a couple minutes when we close this out here. Um, so I think we've actually gone ahead and answered all the questions that we had here, Tom. So Tom, thank you again for your time today and for a really interesting presentation and uh, look forward to speaking with you soon. Awesome, Dave, thank you very much and, and all out there. Thanks for joining us. All right, and thank you to all of you who attended today. We look forward to seeing you hopefully on August 14th for our inaugural CAS webinar, and then on August 22nd for our next expert webinar. Thanks again. Awesome.